state bailouts uh, during the most recent crisis suggest. Both human rights discourse and market fundamentalism <coughs> have either marginalized or dismissed entirely the realm of the social and the importance of economic and collective rights as opposed to individual ones. To assert the simultaneous rise and striking affinities of human rights and market fundamentalism leaves unanswered the crucial questions of whether and how these discourses, movements, and policies were connected. Did they develop simultaneously but separately? The former focusing on law and politics individual rights and security, the latter on economic sufficiency and profits. Has market fundamentalism shaped understandings of economic and social rights? Has the prevailing definition of human rights encouraged neoliberalism by virtue of its neglect of the collective, the economic, and the social? There is no one answer, uh, I would argue, no single relationship between human rights and market fundamentalism across countries and types of rights in the long 1970s. To explore complex entanglements, I want to look at three cases, Eastern Europe, the Southern Cone, well, Latin America in general, and women's economic rights in developing countries. These were major areas in which human rights were defined and new human rights policies developed, and they were important areas where neoliberal policies were debated. The ways in which human rights and market fundamentalism were intertwined and interacted depended on the region and the policies in question. It also depended on Cold War understandings, priorities, and anxieties. For in these decades, Cold War mental maps and military and economic investments were by no means displaced by neoliberalism or by human rights, both of which consciously positioned themselves either as a way to continue to fight the Cold War in new and better ways, or to move beyond the Cold War, but the Cold War was always threatened. Whether the degree and type, whatever the degree and type of entanglement, the dominant understanding of human rights in the 1970s and 80s encouraged governments and NGOs and international organizations to focus on the individual and to prioritize legal and political rights and marginalize economic and social rights, whether in Eastern Europe's uh, transition to capitalism, the authoritarian neoliberal uh, dictatorships in Latin America, or in debates about women and development occurring under the shadow of structural adjustment. It encouraged governments to envision nation building in neoliberal terms, i.e. get market capitalism right and everything else will fall into place. Uh, it encouraged development economists to promote neoliberal models such as microcredit. Market fundamentalism provided human rights with a further rationale for ignoring the social and economic rights. But had these social and economic rights ever been on the agenda, you might well ask. Yes or no? Often overlooked articles in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights lay out a capacious and generous array of social and economic rights in addition to the much better known political and legal protections and rights. These include the right to own property, to social security, the right to work, and to equal pay for equal work. There is the right to an adequate standard of living, and the right of the, and I quote, realization through national effort and international cooperation to the economic, social, and cultural rights indispensable for his dignity and the free development of his personality. Yes, the language is a bit sexist, but this was 19. Um, from the late 1940s through the 1960s, these rights were repeatedly discussed, but almost exclusively in UN circles, and they were finally embodied in the International Covenant for Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights in 1966, which went into force in 1977. But their implementation was consistently deferred on the grounds that such rights were economically unfeasible, or ideologically objectionable, or not judicial. They continued to be marginalized in the last three decades of the 20th century, but that marginalization was not uncontested. Workers in Eastern Europe, the G77 Organization of Developing Countries, UNCTAD, the UN Committee on Trade and Development, and innumerable women's development projects 
sought to put economic and social rights on the agenda or to keep them there, as was the case in Eastern Europe. My project is exploring how both market fundamentalism and human rights often actively and at times intentionally collaborated to prevent that from happening. Let's look first at Eastern Europe. In Eastern Europe and the Western European and American debates and activism around conditions there, human rights and neoliberalism developed separately and sequentially. Human rights came first. Dissent in Eastern Europe and the Helsinki process culminated in the 1975 Helsinki Final Act and a series of subsequent monitoring meetings and saw the creation of the transnational Helsinki network that included Soviet and Eastern European dissidents, new NGOs like the American Helsinki Watch and the International Helsinki Federation, <coughs> and the U.S. government Helsinki Commission. How and why human rights gain such prominence is a matter of dispute, as is whether <coughs> human rights champions, uh, <coughs> particularly outside of Eastern Europe, were motivated by altruism or a mixture of principled economics, anti-communism, some argue that human rights discourse and activism came to the fore when other state-based or international utopias collapsed that same wings work. Uh, others focus on how human rights became a whole Cold War weapon in the hands of American politicians like Senator Scoop Jackson, who pushed through the Jackson Panic Amendment, denying Soviet's most favored nation status because they would not give exit permits to Jews. Jackson's aim was to sabotage. Still others emphasize the role of the European community, which eagerly embraced the call for a conference on security and cooperation in Europe. The EC wanted to increase the exchange of goods and ideas and the movement of people into and out of Eastern Europe, but it also saw official Warsaw Pact recognition of the European community and greater European autonomy in international affairs, especially regarding NATO. The EC alone pushed for the inclusion of human rights in the final amendment. The U.S. government was not interested in raising the right to emigrate and freedom of religion and speech. Nixon advisor and later Secretary of State Henry Kissinger saw these as marginal to the key issues of missiles and borders and potentially disruptive of superpower detente. He opposed the Jackson Bank Amendment and when the Helsinki Final Act was being drawn up, uh, Kissinger dismissively said, they can write it in Swahili for all I care. <coughs> the Soviets reacted positively to the Final Act, believing that it recognized post-1945 orders and that the human rights clauses would in fact not be taken seriously. Reactions in Western Europe were mainly positive, those in the United States largely negative. Although President Gerald Ford endorsed the Helsinki Final Act, the American media was uniformly hostile. Jimmy Carter condemned Helsinki while the candidate, then embraced human rights while president, uh, and later Ronald Reagan <coughs> dismissed human rights, but then invoked them to chastise the Soviets nonetheless. The Helsinki Final Act imposed no juridical obligations on the 35 signatories. Uh, but it laid out a definition of human rights that was to prove enormously influential in its focus on political and civil rights only. It called for the equal right and self-determination of all people, as well as the respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms, including freedom of thought, conscience, religion, uh, or belief. It contained human rights language affirming freer contacts, family reunification, and educational and Exchanges. Although it urged improved commerce, more scientific and technological exchanges, and cooperation on industrial projects and addressed environmental issues, no economic and social rights were specified or defended. In the wake of Helsinki, human rights activism flourished across Europe uh, and in the U.S. Its roots were many. There were dissident intellectuals and scientists in the Soviet Union, such as Andrei Sakharov, that was Solidarity and the Workers' Defense League in Poland and Charter 77 in Czechoslovakia. In Western Europe, the EC uh, and the CSCE, the Conference on Security and Cooperation in Europe, were advocates. The U.S. government established the Helsinki Commission and NGOs like Helsinki 
watched in amnesty gave voice and leverage to Eastern European dissidents by gathering and publicizing information about human rights violations and blaming and shaming communist governments. Human rights discourse and activism in regard to Eastern Europe found such resonance because the governments targeted fit neatly within Cold War categories. <coughs> U.S. Cold War categories and within Western European desires to both criticize the Soviet bloc uh, and pursue European-style detente with it. The human rights defendants stayed safely within the political and legal definitions that had dominated human rights talk since the late 1940s. The focus of Helsinki activism was on the freedom of individuals to speak, move, and believe. Dissent came from intellectuals, in many cases, but with whom Westerners could identify. Uh, they fell clearly within Amnesty International's category of prisoners of conscience. Social and economic rights were not discussed for multiple reasons. For dissidents, it was political rights and civil liberties that were lacking. After all, communist regimes championed social and economic rights and had throughout the 50s and 60s, even if they were distributed inadequately and unevenly. Most Western European countries had social democratic welfare states and took social rights for granted. From a UN standpoint, however, seeing social and economic rights as human rights was politically controversial, if not totally unacceptable, uh, for <coughs> both kind of ideological reasons and as with so many human rights issues, it was seen as a threat uh, to uh, sovereignty uh, and hence the U.S. Congress has been reluctant uh, to uh, sign on to to, or to ratify uh, the various human rights conventions that American governments have signed on to. American human rights organizations were no different. Aria and I, the founder of Human Rights Watch, for example, rejected an economic and social rights, he said, out of a commitment to democracy. He insisted economic issues did not qualify Market fundamentalism was not a part of Eastern European discussions, nor of the discourse about it or policies toward Eastern Europe in the 70s and 80s. To be sure, there were economic reformers in Poland, Czechoslovakia, and Hungary who theorized and tried to implement varieties of market socialism. They recognized the pervasive inefficiencies of total planning and advocated decentralization of control of planning, prices that would provide accurate information, and small-scale plots and businesses. They wanted to enhance consumption and improve technology in some states, particularly the three mentioned, Poland, Czechoslovakia, and Hungary, along with East Germany, took steps in that direction, often by borrowing heavily and going heavily into debt to Western banks. These reformers, however, did not envision a radical dismantling of socialism. There was a network of Eastern European and American mathematical economists that Joanna Workman has written about, who had been in dialogue about the problems of socialist economies throughout the Cold War. They discussed whether socialist economies and neoclassical ideas were compatible, and how socialist economies could be reformed. This network had virtually uh, no visibility, however, in Eastern Europe or in the U.S. in the 70s and 80s. Only after 89 did its Eastern European members emerge to promote not market socialism. 
said they envisioned it uh, a bit capitalism of a social democratic rather than a neoliberal sort, although I found a few indications that anyone is talking about the demise of capitalism uh, throughout uh, the 70s and 80s. The U.S. was more inclined to restrict trade and loans and impose sanctions to punish human rights violations, but it too did not foresee a neoliberal transformation. To be sure, there were free market thinkers in the U.S. Uh, for whom communism was the enemy par excellence. It embodied, from their view, the horrors of state control and planning, centralization, and public ownership, and resulted in the curtailment of freedom, initiative, efficiency, and, of course, profits. Uh, but Hayek and his alkalites in the Montpelier Society did not imagine any more than Western European and American politicians did that the collapse of communism was imminent and the implementation of neoliberal policies feasible. Their main concern was reforming Western capitalism in these decades uh, because they saw Western capitalism as going in a dangerously wrong uh, direction due either to Keynesianism or social democratic welfare policies or in other parts of uh, the less developed areas of import substitution, industrialization, or, or wrong-headed uh, development policies. Well, human rights and market fundamentalism thus did not significantly inform one another over the long 1970s in Eastern Europe. They both occupied, they both occupied center stage after 1989 when Eastern European countries faced the dual challenge of constructing democratic governments and capitalist economies. This makes their transitions very different than what had gone on or was going on in Latin America. How then <clears throat> were human rights and market fundamentalism entangled? It was not simply that foreign banks, international institutions, and American neoliberal economists sought to impose shock therapy that destroyed social rights and imposed enormous economic burdens. Although that is one part of the story. There were multiple internal as well as external actors pursuing a variety of other agendas. Nor is the alternative tale of a joyous embrace of human rights, democracy, and capitalism by Eastern Europeans who had liberated themselves adequately. As Stephen Kotlin has argued, outside of Poland, 1989 was about collapse more than revolution, and those inheriting power, even in Poland, had clearer ideas about politics than they did about economics. Sometimes, from the end of 89 on, proponents of human rights and democratization and those advocating neoliberalism cooperated. Sometimes they conflicted. But more often, they seem to have moved on separate tracks and deployed separate discourses. To be sure, Polish solidarity invited neoliberal economists, both Polish and foreign, to design economic reforms, as did Havel in Czechoslovakia and later Gorbachev in Russia. But these dissidents and economists had not had close prior contact. It was a marriage of necessity not the expression of long-standing networks or shared outlets. The dissidents and economists spoke different languages. The former were fluent in the demands of Helsinki for individual rights, political freedom, and legal protections. The emphasis was on civil and political rights and formally <coughs> democratic institutions, although solidarity had a history of, of arguing for social rights as well. The dissidents believed, in the words of Ralph Darnold, that Eastern Europeans shed a closed system in order to create an open society. The economists, local and foreign, were obsessed, uh, however, were obsessed with different things. They were obsessed with ongoing problems of debt, inflation, and inefficiency. They believed that Eastern Europeans had shed communism in order to embrace capitalism, and that capitalism had to be created as rapidly as possible because economic problems were acute and social unrest was feared. These economists invoked the holy trinity of macroeconomic stabilization, price liberalization, and privatization. This was not the language of rights, uh, but of game class 
To be sure, privatization entails property rights. But privatization was discussed most often in terms of eliminating inefficient managers, obsolete plants, and, and excess workers. The virtues of wholesale privatization was assumed, and the relative importance of property rights versus other clients was ignored. While the technicalities of who should own <coughs> and, how, and how they should own proved economically complex, politically divisive, and all absorbing. Social and economic rights outside of privatization were not a focus of concern, and they met their own fate. Some were immediately eliminated by stabilization and liberalization, food and housing subsidies, for example. But others had to be created to deal with the exigencies of capitalism <clears throat> that had been absent under socialism, for example, unemployment insurance. Still others had to be restructured because benefits were distributed through factories uh, that were then being privatized uh, or dismantled. Even the radical proponents of shock therapy, like Jeffrey Sachs, did not favor a total abolition of social programs, but rather emphasized that benefits were to be downsized, more need-based, more time-limited, and more efficiently delivered. Uh, <clears throat> in fact, what was to happen by the mid-90s in the face of the economic crisis was that many of the benefits simply disappeared. More importantly, for economists, getting the economy right took priority over anything else. Social policies were residual. To be thought about when necessary to solve problems that might hinder the transition to capitalism, but not otherwise. And they were discussed not in the language of rights or entitlements, but in terms of needs. This was, I think, a significant neoliberal victory. And it wasn't balanced by anyone from the outside insisting on social rights. Uh, the European, uh, <coughs> the EC, uh, didn't raise the issue of social rights, or if it did, I haven't uh, found evidence, and I still have a lot of research to do. Uh, the OECD, uh, which was paying a lot of attention, attention to Eastern Europe, talked about only pluralist democracies and market economies. Uh, it's very little room or no obvious space uh, for uh, social and social rights in that. There were certainly loud complaints from those who lost their social entitlements and guaranteed right to work. Industrial workers across Europe, Eastern Europe, and women much more than men, not only in terms of the workplace, but also in terms of family-related social rights. <laughs> but governments were preoccupied with economic problems that the swift introduction of markets and privatization had failed to solve. Indeed, they had created a host of problems of their own throughout the 1990s. Governments remained concerned more with individual political and legal rights, not collective ones. Whether they believed social rights were a discredited heritage of the old regime that one could dispense with, um, or assumed that certain rights would self-evidently be retained, like state-run pensions and universal health insurance, uh, is something that I still need uh, to investigate. I found evidence for, for both views. The former GDR uh, was the only exception uh, to this uh, sort of failure to talk about the social and erosion of social rights. The price of reunification was a colonization that erratically undermined the economy, uh, but the upside was an extension of the West German social model uh, to the new states of the former East. Let me turn more briefly to my other two cases. Latin America presents a dramatically different picture than Eastern Europe. The Cold War was much hotter in Latin America than in Europe, the political repression more deadly, and neoliberal experimentation very extensive. Human rights violations, the defense of human rights, and the promotion of neoliberal reforms occurred simultaneously. Individually and together, these developments caused intense conflict within societies like Chile and El Salvador, as well as internationally. Both proponents and opponents of human rights constantly weighed the economic 
implications of the positions they took, just as those favoring or opposing neoliberalism argued about its possible effects on human rights promotion. They were much more in conversation with one another than had been the case in Eastern Europe. As old and new authoritarian governments in Brazil, Chile, Argentina, and across Central America tortured, disappeared, and murdered tens of thousands of their citizens, domestic human rights groups <coughs> emerged, and the UN and NGOs from many countries criticized and pressured authoritarian regimes. American officials remained deeply divided about whether to punish human rights violations or tolerate them as necessary uh, part of defending against purported communist threats. Economic concerns permeated these debates. Some sought to curb U.S. military aid without hurting economic relations. Others favored punitive sanctions to produce reform. And still others sought cooperation with repressive regimes as a way to reform economies according to market fundamentalist dictates. In the Americas, multiple economic crises, the collapse of bread and woods, the exhaustion of Fordism, the mixed success of import substitution industrialization, uh, in Latin America and growing Latin American debts made neoliberal ideas popular among many government officials, corporations, banks, academic economists, as well as within the IMF and the World Bank. They used the opportunities created by coups and debt crises to force through structural adjustment programs that dramatically altered economies in states with detrimental effects. Chile was uh, under the dictatorship of Augusto Pinochet, provides a classic example of human rights violations, international activism, official American ambivalence, and neoliberal success. In the wake of the 1973 coup that overthrew the democratically elected government of the Social Democratic Salvador Allende in the ensuing massive repression, governments around the world, the UN, the Organization of American States, and human rights groups led by Amnesty International and the International Commission of Jurists, launched massive protests. The U.S. government, however, did not condemn the coup. The Nixon administration and American multinationals, uh, like International Telephone and Telegraph, regarded the prospect of a peaceful and democratic transition in a socialist direction in Chile as a threat to American economic and security interests. The CIA tried to destabilize the Chilean economy and encouraged the military to move against Allende. After the coup, Kissinger said, he was my then Secretary of State, we are, said to Pinochet, we are sympathetic with what you are trying to do here. We want to help you, not undermine you. Congress, however, spoke out quite forcefully against the repression in Chile, uh, led by uh, Donald Fraser, who protested human rights violations. Uh, later, Carter, uh, as president, cut military, but not economic aid to Chile. Ronald Reagan, however, was to reverse the policy because he agreed with his advisor, Gene Kirkpatrick, that the U.S. should work with authoritarian governments, no matter what their human rights violations, uh, but not with totalitarian ones, no matter uh, what their human rights violations. The coup against Allende opened the way for the first experiment of neoliberal shock therapy. After the dictatorship failed to restore prosperity and curb inflation, the Chilean government invited 
Shall I set the model for the U.S. responses to human rights violations in other parts of Latin America? The U.S. government sent very mixed signals. Congress, as well as human rights organizations, criticized human rights abuses much more strenuously than did the executive branch, even under Jimmy Carter. Military aid proved easier to curtail than economic assistance or loans for both supporters and opponents of an assertive human rights policy worried about investment opportunities, export markets, and natural resources for the crisis with the U.S. economy and its ties uh, across Central and South America uh, were uh, very important. The Nixon, Ford, and Reagan administration publicly dismissed oppositional forces as marginal and naive, and while privately assuring repressive regimes and their militaries that the U.S. supported them uh, out of national security and economic considerations that outweigh uh, attention to human rights. Chile also set the pattern for the kinds of abuses on which the U.S. and others would focus in the third world, namely threats to the security of the person, torture, prolonged imprisonment, summary execution, inhumane treatment, and genocide that featured prominently, while the rights to free speech, freedom of religion, and freedom of movement that dominated in regard to Eastern Europe were downplayed. So too were economic and social rights, and hence any critique of the consequences of neoliberal economic reform in human rights terms. Okay. <coughs> Chile is much more human rights market fundamentalism are much more entangled in Chile than elsewhere, although I need to do a lot more reading to try to figure out what the Argentine case is and what was going on in Central America. Uh, I think in part in Central America, the ongoing civil wars meant that there was very little effort to push neoliberal reform through much of this period, and great willingness on the part of the Americans, although the American government to tolerate human rights abuses. Okay. My third case, which is on women, women's economic rights and development. The 1970s and 1980s saw the economic and social rights of the global south reasserted from multiple directions. After the disappointing result of the 1960s decade of development, a plethora of new theories and programs were debated. In 1975, the G77 of developing countries and UNCTAD proposed uh, a new international economic order uh, that was to regulate commodity prices and give the global south a greater say in the IMF and the World Bank. In 1986, the UN General Assembly passed a declaration on the right to development that linked individual and collective social and economic rights. In 1976, the UN proclaimed the Decade of Women. In a gesture to first, second, and third worlds, its themes were equality, peace, and development. <laughs> Women's rights came to be recognized as human rights. Yet social rights proved no easier to defend for women in the global south than for Eastern Europeans or Latin Americans. In line with the concerns of the larger human rights movement, Women focused attention first and foremost on issues of freedom from bodily harm and personal security. These include violence against women, forced marriage, sex trafficking, and female genital mutilation. These are enormously important, but did not directly address women's social rights around health and education or women's access to employment. At the four UN women's conferences from Mexico City in 1977 to Beijing in 19. In Mexico City in 1975 and to Beijing in 1995, women readily agreed on the need to protect women from gender-based violence, but first world women, uh, particularly in the early years, prioritized political and legal changes as the means to achieve equality and individual freedom, while third world women emphasized economic and social changes, collective struggles, and mutual interdependence. The convention to end all forms of discrimination against women, CEDAW, which passed in the UN General Assembly in 1979, repeated the hierarchy of rights that had been laid out in the two conventions for political and civil rights on the one hand, and then uh, social, economic, and cultural on the other. CEDAW began with legal rights and 
protections then move to political ones, economic and social rights were only in part three. But these were important. They included the right to work, to loans, to social benefits, and the right to women's equal participation in development projects. Revealingly, neither Amnesty nor Human Rights Watch was interested in defending the social rights enumerated in Seagull. Indeed, they seem to pay very little attention to Seagull at all. Developments and debates and policies both gave prominence to women's social and economic rights and limited how they were discussed. Women had been marginalized in development programs in the 50s and 60s, but in the 70s, economic, economists and feminists recognized that persistent poverty and failed development projects were partly a result of the neglect of women's vital economic roles and their exclusion from funding and technical training. Women's rights and women in development began to be discussed together. The UN Human Rights Commission established a subcommittee on development in 1981. Uh, this aroused a strong critique from the US and other industrialized countries who opposed this, arguing that attention to economic issues and development was a dilution, a dilution of the Commission's human rights mission. The World Bank and other development agencies and women's NGOs argued that development programs should be asserted, assessed, not only in terms of how much they raised the gross national product, but also in terms of how well they had basic needs and distributed opportunities and benefits more equitably. Despite these encouraging signs, the 1980 warning of Theo von Boven, the head of the UN Division of Human Rights, suggested the challenges remaining. Boven wrote, unless we can effectively bridge the gap between the realm of human rights and economics, we risk the pursuit, on the one hand, of an international economic order which neglects the fundamental human development objectives of all our endeavors, and on the other, of a shallow approach to human rights which neglects the deeper structural causes of injustice. The bridging he advocated occurred only partially and in ways that were profoundly shaped by market fundamentalism. The economic crisis of the 1970s hit the global south much harder than the north, and the 1980s were a lost decade in terms of development as funds flowed from south to north to pay debts and inequality. The new international economic order was defeated. Instead, Western banks and the IMF and World Bank imposed structural adjustment policies across the developing world. These neoliberal measures mandated often draconian cuts in state spending, and women and girls were more likely to lose access to health care, education, and government jobs than men and boys. Cuts were particularly harmful to women and in households, which were numerous across parts of Africa. The imposition of free trade and the free flow of capital often meant job losses and forced women and men to migrate abroad uh, where they had neither citizenship nor social benefits nor protection from economic and, and often for women sexual exploitation. These processes began in the 1970s, but only now are groups like Human Rights Watch working on the multiple violations. From the 1970s on, women's economic roles and rights have been increasingly defined in neoliberal terms. Women economists developed the women in development approach. It stressed that women like men could and should be rational actors <laughs> pursuing their self-interest, but of course not neglecting their family obligations. Women were necessary for development, women in development advocates argued, and would make development more efficient. The women in, development, women in development approach became popular when free market solutions were being widely imposed. But women as feminist critics in third world research centers like Dawn and Aloy have shown are less able to operate in an open market system, especially when it deprives them of social supports and ignores the demands of pregnancy and childcare. These newer development models no longer exclude women from development, but insist on uh, inserting them on terms defined around the lives of men as imagined by the 
Microcredit, which has proliferated across the global south, is a perfect example of how women's economic rights were defined and met in neoliberal terms. Microcredit loans came to enable the poorest of the poor to eke out a livelihood by establishing tiny businesses, uh, buying a cow to sell milk, uh, or weaving and selling cloth. Lenders charge market rates to borrowers and often benefit critics say, much more than do the borrowers. Women are overwhelmingly the preferred borrowers, as they have proven much more reliable uh, in paying back their loans than men. In addition, running a business from home enables women to meet their family obligations while earning income. Microcredit explicitly seeks to instill an entrepreneurial spirit in its clients to give them a sense of ownership and to compensate for ever-diminishing state programs. It focuses on the individual, not the social, and celebrates the workings of the market as a means to better. Muhammad Yunus, founder of the Grameen Bank, the pioneer micro-lending institution, has insisted on, quote, the need to promote credit as a human right, end quote. This now dominant vision, endorsed by development experts, international financial institutions, and social entrepreneurs, offers a far thinner vision of women's human rights than did the third world, than did third world women and human rights activists in the 1970s. Okay, let me conclude. Entanglements between human rights and market fundamentalism did not run in one direction, nor did these two discourses and practices reinforce one another at every moment. Yet separately and together since the 1970s, they created an environment in which both became prominent, indeed hegemonic. They appealed to many, and even those <coughs> opposed to one or the other resignedly accept them as basic facts of an emerging world. Critics, doubters, and cynics had learned to talk within those discourses rather than to reject them in total. The new global order is one in which human rights are widely invoked, is certainly not always respected. Human rights has become the language in which demands can be made, good causes advocated, legitimacy claimed, and interventions of all sorts justified. States have to take account of human rights in their policies at home and in terms of their reputational status and possibilities for aid and alliances. But the definition of human rights is individual, political, and legal. Social and economic rights whether individual or collective, are, I think, as marginalized now as in the 1950s and 1960s, despite rhetorical gestures for their importance. They are even more in danger. The new global order was and still is dominated by market fundamentalism, even in the wake of the 2008 crisis, when for a very brief moment came to us back uh, and seems to have disappeared once again. Neoliberalism is now common sense, and the application of market criteria to all aspects of social and political life is considered by many as inevitable, whatever the cost to individual institutions and entire economies.